welcome to day three of the Transform 911 convening. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rebecca Newstetter, and like I've shared on the prior days, I'm like the orchestra conductor of this amazing project. My job is to set the table to get out of the way and to let you all hear from the most amazing co-chairs and speakers that will come before you to, to share their, their recommendations today. You'll see that the real music comes from the committed and talented people who've put together the content that we're introducing today and that we introduced yesterday and Wednesday. Our North Star, Transform 911 envisions a 911 system that equitably and reliably increases access to well being for those who need emergency assistance, the professionals who staff 911, and those who are deployed to respond. We build on the extraordinary and positive innovations in the field to address the challenges and inequities that are within our reach and our control, recognizing that the change we envision cannot happen without shifts in the systems and the communities that 911 serves. For the past five months, over 100 committed, talented people from all across the country have been working in six different work groups to identify what it will take to get to that North Star. Each work group is guided by a really amazing set of co-chairs whose brilliance, creativity, and unwavering commitment to the hard work of change is deeply inspiring. Each work group's membership represents deep and diverse perspectives to surface what we know, what's working, and what's not. To assist in generating recommendations, work groups relied on a literature review and in-depth discussions. Some also interviewed experts outside of their membership. You'll hear about all of these discussions today and the research that informed them. The research is available on our website at transform911.org in the resource hub. In just a few short months, these work groups have done the incredible work of pulling together bold recommendations. This is where you come in. The recommendations are not final. They need you. Each session today is designed to be deeply interactive. What you share with us matters and will inform the continued evolution of our work. At the end of each day, the recommendations have been posted online with further opportunities to provide feedback as will be done today. The recommendations are housed online at transform911.org slash recommendations. Please provide input and share the opportunity to do so widely with your networks. Thank you for your help and commitment. Today, you'll hear updates from two of these work groups, 911 Governance and Alternative Hotlines. I want to thank our project sponsors, Arnold Ventures, Microsoft's Justice Reform Initiative, and the Sosai Foundation, along with our par project partners, all of the amazing work group chairs and work group members who you'll meet over the next few hours. They represent organizations, geographies, and experiences that cover a wide range of perspectives as well as our partners from the Full Frame Initiative. I also wanna thank the University of Chicago, the Health Lab, and all the amazing Transform 911 staff and advisors, and our colleagues from Joyful Signing, who have brought to this conversation today, sign language interpretation. Thank you to you all. Before we jump in, a note on our format. Because we have people joining us from so many different time zones and in so many situations, we encourage you to take breaks when it makes sense for you rather than our scheduling multiple breaks throughout the day. We have an amazing couple of hours scheduled before us and the time is going to fly by. Over the next few hours, you're gonna hear from a number of fabulous speakers, each of whom has dedicated their time and expertise over the past several months to generating these recommendations towards transforming 911. We invite you to lean in, listen, and engage in discussion for both of our sessions today. Over the next few hours, you're going to hear from Jerry Clayton and Jeannie Milstein, representing and presenting on behalf of the 911 Governance Work Group. We also thank Stephanie Olson, a co-chair of this work group, who is meeting with her city council today, so unfortunately is unable to join us, but has been a key contributor to the discussions you'll hear. And Mariela Ruiz Angel, Jasmine Desidero, Moki Macias, and Mary Noam representing and presenting on behalf of the Alternative Hotlines work group. And the contributions of the fabulous work group members who the work group chairs will introduce to you shortly. 
We will also be hearing directly from the 911 professionals who take calls and help us access well being and care nationally regarding the deep challenges and the opportunities that exist in this space for them as professionals, the other first line responders, and for those of us who may be in need of emergency crisis response and who use 911 and alternative hotlines to access this care. We will hear from one such professional now. Hi, my name is Julian Silvestri and I work in the city of Tucson, Arizona for the 911 Dispatch Center. Part of the things that I find most rewarding about being a 911 operator are the fact that I can have an impact and I truly am a first responder, even though sometimes we're not granted that status. If more people knew about uh, the ability and the impact that they could have from a 911 standpoint without necessarily needing to be an officer, I feel like a lot more people would have a better opinion of 911 operators and telecommunicators um, that might help uh, people want to apply and actually be in a telecommunicator position. One thing that would help better support 911 professionals across the board is, is better training programs. Uh, a lot of the people who call into 911 have mental health issues or issues that aren't police or fire or medical related, but a lot of the times this 911 is their only option. Uh, a lot of call takers aren't really trained to handle people that have or are having a mental health crisis or trained in de-escalation techniques. Those are typically thought of as police training issues and not on the telecommunicator side. So having those training ability or training opportunities available to all of us would be beneficial across the board. It wouldn't help us speak to them better, speak on their level, connect with them easier to try and provide them with the best resources possible. Um, we have a lot of the tools available in order to assist with that, but it's not always perfect. One thing that I could see being beneficial as well is providing a system that's available to all of the area, not just in fire and police dispatch, um, but also for mental health crisis, for food bank workers, so that we can all have access to the same group information for these people that we're serving, because we do serve a lot of the same people in common on a regular basis. I could say that policymakers could do better is uh, possibly providing a standardized certification program. I know some uh, states will have a certification program for 911 operators, uh, but not every state does. And it would be beneficial across the board nationwide if we had that sort of certification program. Many thanks to Julian for sharing his recommendations with us. Before turning to the work groups, I'd like to each ask each of the co-chairs to help get the conversation started with us today. You are all very busy people. You're each passionate about the work that you do and about this project. Can you please give us a soundbite about what's behind that passion for you? And I'll start with Jerry. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for, for having me. So uh, I, I'll start off first that I'm a part of this process. Uh, because you invited me, you know, I admire your work, especially in this, uh, how you reflect back on history of the different institutions in preparation for how we evolve moving forward. So that's what got me here. But what has kept me in this particular space is, uh, you know, I view my job and I view everything I've done, I've done through multiple lenses, right? So uh, there are two that are the primary influencer. I'm 57 years on this planet as a black man. So I've had that experience. I have three sons. Um, and and I, I, I take this work or I view this work through the lens of not only myself and my sons, but all the people that have come before me and the people that will come in front of me. The other lens is the profession that I represent, policing. And I think it is a no, there's noble intent to the profession. And I think if we look historically, police have been a, a major contributor to co-producing public safety and community well-being. But it's also been a major contributor as part of American culture that has contributed harm historically to all Americans, but specifically people of color. I'm motivated to engage in this space because I think this is a thoughtful and deliberate action to create public safety, community well-being, and, and acknowledgement of 911 being a critical piece of that. Um, and more than anything else, uh, I hope to learn so much more than what I contribute. So thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Sheriff Clayton, we really appreciate you and the work that you're doing. Jeannie, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And first, I'd like to thank all the 911 professionals. I'm really in awe of you. And I see that Carrie is here from New London. And I, just last night, um, the 911 professionals helped deliver a baby. And I think one of the first times I called 911 from New London, uh, New London is uh, in the southeastern part of Connecticut, located on the Long Island Sound and the Thames River. And I called 911 
And a 911 pro pro professional from Long Island, which is about an hour ferry ride from here, answered the phone. So I just assumed that the 911 professional was right down the street from me. So it really, really made me start thinking about 911. And then as our community has made public safety and mental health a priority, um, then I really started to lean in because our emphasis in our community is around well being and race equity. So it made me start thinking that we really have to connect the dots here because the 911 professionals are dealing with often life and death. And then you go from delivering a baby to an overdose to a domestic violence. And again, I'm just in awe of the, the knowledge and, and the patience and just the having to just shift so quickly. And so I think for me right now, it's about what is, what are the standards? You know, we've learned a lot and we'll learn a lot more this afternoon. And, and how do we connect these dots around well-being? Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you for being here. And thank you for sharing that story. Uh, well wishes to the, to the new family as they welcome the baby. Mariela, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everybody. My name is Mariela Ruiz Angel. And I think what drives my passion is you know, just my lived experiences. I am the daughter of um, immigrant. I am a proud Chicana whose mother was heavily involved in the Chicano movement. Um, and so in, in my previous work as an organizer in the community in working with immigrants and refugees, I saw the disparities. I saw the inequities. Um, I see it today, even in the current job I'm at, um, where we see that families who um, right speak different languages and have different cultures or treated differently um, from the very beginning, from the time you call 911, if they even do, um, because of the mistrust that's been caused um, for generations before, um, all the way to just the in general experience, right, that they have with police and first responders. And I think that this transition for me from working in um, communities and specifically with immigrants and refugees and into now this first responder model, um, it's, it's what keeps me pushing. It's to make sure that I have this really amazing opportunity to be at the round table in which um, I may, right, I may never get again. And I think, it, you know, for somebody who's in um, city government, um, I might only have this opportunity for four more years. So I'm going to do everything I can to make sure my voice and my, the voice of my community, um, women of color, um, is, is heard loud and clear. Thank you, Mariela. Thank you for the service in your community and for this initiative. We really appreciate you. Moki. Good afternoon. Good morning for some. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Moki Macias. I'm the executive director for the Policing Alternatives and Diversion Program um, in Atlanta, more affectionately known as PAD. Um, and, you know, a big part of the work that we're doing here in Atlanta is geared toward reducing the number of non-emergency calls that go into 911 for quality of life concerns and behavioral health. And then really making 311 um, through a partnership with our city 311 line, a viable option for those concerns by providing in-person responders. And so for me, this planning process, the conversations that we've got to, gotten to have with so many people across the fields, um, related to 911 has just been so critical in understanding how we collectively use 911 now, what the pain points are in the current system, how 911 telecommunicators need to be supported, what communities expect from a, a emergency response system and what their other needs are that they've been consistently told to simply use the emergency system for, even if it's not the most appropriate place ultimately. All of that context, I think for, for me, what is most exciting about that um, is that it really is going to help us also design the new infrastructure that we need to reduce the current pressures on, on the 911 system. So I think those two efforts need to go hand in hand and it's exciting to be a part of that. Thank you, Moki. It's a pleasure to have you part of this and to watch PAD as it's been growing over the past number of years and becoming really a model across the world. Jasmine. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here and joining us. 
Um, so the reason why I'm a part of this project and particularly with the efforts completed in the city of Albuquerque is I've worked um, many years in crisis prevention, intervention, and postvention, especially in Native American communities from rural areas across the state of New Mexico. And one of the biggest um, challenges we have are how are we getting 911 services to areas that don't have the um, availability of such type services. So I feel like this particular project has helped me understand more of what is being done at a higher level and try to ensure that the needs and gaps and services of those particular areas, especially in communities that are marginalized, understand that there are services out there and how can we better meet those needs in those particular areas. Thank you so much, Jasmine. We really appreciate you bringing those voices and that perspective here. And Mary. Good morning, good afternoon all. I'm Mary Naom, uh, working with the Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative in Atlanta. Um, you know, and, and thinking about this initiative, just really focused in on transforming our 911 system, just got me thinking about, you know, for me, I think transformative systems change begins with people kind of on the ground in their communities, trying out new ways of doing things, right? You know, people who know through personal and professional experiences what is working and what is not working, you know, people who are willing to meaningfully engage their communities to learn, you know, what folks want and need and, and who are willing to swim against the current to come up with solutions that better center people's dignity and, and well-being. Um, it's that kind of creative risk-taking, that, that stewarding of a vision and, and making it come to life at the local level, you know, that's what drives my passion. And, and, and I think that the work that we're doing here at, at, uh, with Transform 911 is so powerful because we have an opportunity to, to be in conversation with and learn from community leaders who are conducting these kind of experiments all across the country uh, and pool together all that we're learning to support kind of the creation of quality, kind of transparent options for people to be met with appropriate care and service in their moment of crisis. Um, and that's what I'm here and, and passionate about. So thank you. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your time and passion with us. We look forward to today's conversation. And with that, I will turn it to Jerry and Jeannie. Thank you so much.